So good afternoon, everyone. If you haven't met me before, my name is David Sequera and I'm the director of the Fiona and Sydney Maya Gallery here at the Victorian College of the Arts. And it really is my pleasure to welcome you here to Art Forum today. And um, before I introduce the speakers and tell you a little bit about, um, a little bit about the, the, the session this afternoon, I want to take a moment and invite you to join me in grounding yourselves in the really deep knowledge that long before, you know, for generations before the VCA was thought of or the University of Melbourne was considered, that the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Greater Kulin Nation practiced song and dance, they made sculptures, made paintings, they shared stories and practiced healing on this land. And um, we don't take it lightly that we get to do what it is that we get to do on land that's imbued with, um, with such creativity and vitality. And it's really with great honor that I acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. So before I introduce our speakers, I wanna tell you a little bit about today's art forum, about art forum full stop. So look, if you see me looking a little bit antsy, it's because we're doing an art forum first today. We are um, live in Federation Hall for students and staff of the Victorian College of the Arts. And we are um, simulcast live on Zoom for people all over the planet. So wherever you are, a big, big welcome to you. And um, really a big shout out to my colleague, Jun Yoon, who um, has managed all of the um, technical side of this whole thing. Just so you know, don't ask me how it's working, but she knows how it's working, okay? Um, so these, uh, it's our intention that Art Forum is also recorded and posted on our website in the, in the coming weeks. So um, firstly, welcome, welcome, welcome. And now to our speakers. Okay, I'm just gonna read this little thing that I wrote um, because it's a lot easier than um, introducing each speaker. We've got a triple bill today. And our triple bill is Rachel Button, Nick Mullally, and Nabila Norden. And, you know, I approached all three of them to be in an exhibition called Be My Once in a Lifetime last year, and they jumped at it. And here's what I wrote. Allowing ideas of tenderness, romance, clumsiness, and dagginess to bubble away and percolate within their studio practices, Rachel Button, Nick Mullally, and Nabila Norden have developed new video paintings and sculptures that, be, that can be connected with the messy sweetness that we know as love. I can't help thinking about the awkwardness of relationships when I consider Nabila Norden's sculptural processes of pushing, pressing and embellishing. Often, in, often precariously balanced, the intensely worked surfaces give little indication of their underlying structural support. Rachel Button's videos positioned as a pearl within a plastic sandpit or wading pool clamshell alludes to the persistence of internalized monologues that seem part of the course of being in a relationship. And for me, entering into the warm glow of Nick Mullally's dreaming, dreamy imagery is like soaking in a visual love song. Nabila completed her MFA in 2015 um, here at the VCA. Rachel went through painting and completed her degree in 2019 um, and Nick, uh, did painting in 2017 and then honours in 2018. Um, we're going to start off with Rachel, but please make all three speakers very, very welcome. Hello. Um, uh, I'm sure like a lot of you, um, art school profoundly changed my life. Um, for the first time, I learned the total joy of art and life intertwined. And I knew that I had finally found the structure to live, the blueprint in which to carry on. I graduated from VCA in 2019 from the painting department, but by that time I was making video works. I described my work as like a school play, a ramshackle production, motivated by both passion and budgetary limitations, but tenacity is stronger than technical ability. 
Anne Boyer wrote of the artist Kanaruki that a life practice integrated with an art practice has the capacity to intensify meaning, even during the strangeness of life's crisis experiences. Those near in inevitabilities of grief, illness and pain, liveliness in art, artfulness in life, each has the potential to expand and address contradictions and uncertainties, to live in extreme and expressive states of ambiguity, irony and sensitivity. I would argue that the capacity for openness and flow is a central question of my work. The possibility to critically engage with borders and live in a state of flow and vulnerability. This is still from my uh, 2019 work, The Beatles at Shea Stadium, with the Beatles cut out. Here, women's love is necessarily ecstatic, joyful, painful, and overwhelming, a lowering of the guard, a surrender to feeling. For me, art is necessarily open, porous, and exposure of the self and integrated with the experience of life. To love is to be open to possibilities. The traumatic collective experience of these past few years has further emphasized the nature of human porousness. We are so easily able to ingest the breath of others and transmit infection through openings in our bodies. Porousness therefore holds the dual position of possibility as well as danger. Next slide, please. The myth of the individual is the myth of a closed body. Developing as a revelation, these ideas expose to me the fragility of the self-made and self-contained individual. The writer Alan Watts picked apart the assumption that I myself is a center which confronts the external world, which is both alien and strange. Instead, Watts argues that there is no external world that the body is not part of. Similarly, Josh, Joshua Mustafa argues that the word individual has come to be used almost interchangeably with person. This conflation posits our separation from others as an essential quality of being human. It precludes other notions of personhood in which togetherness, not individuation, are foundational to our humanity. My work became a question of where the individual ended, but sorry, where the individual began and ended, or indeed if the concept existed at all. I argued that not only are we in the world, but we are of the world and we are profoundly obligated to it. How can a reframing of vulnerability and flow of centralizing an ethic to love and obligation aid us? What is our ethical obligation to others and the world? My new work, Belly Button, a film about the experiences of a baby and placenta in the womb, is the attempt to bring to fruition what Alan Watts calls a new experience, a new feeling of what it is to be I. This new definition is predicated on the belief that we are embedded and intertwined to an ecology both with and beyond the human. Freud wrote at the height of being in love, the boundary between the ego and object threatened to melt away. A man who is in love declares that I and you are one and is prepared to believe, behave as if it were a fact. What would our world look like if this process was extrapolated beyond a private relationship with the beloved? In such an instance, love becomes an ethical process. I think that my work is indebted to the possibility of art to reframe experiences. This process became, began with my video work, Fish Leg, in 2019, the story of an evolutionary fish experiencing the contemporary world. I wanted to offer an alternative to the scientific diagram. This reframing gives a dignity to that which has, has previously been sidelined or objectified. In the case of fish leg, the work asks how a progressive timeline frames knowledge. The fish is not, sorry, fish leg is not a transi transitory offshoot of some larger timeline, but its own fully whole subject. Next slide, please. Similarly, in my new work, Belly Button, the placenta is a symbol for both the ethical and symbiotic. This work centers, celebrates, and gives dignity to the placenta and its essential role in the development of human life. The baby does not own the placenta. It's a relationship of mutual obligation, which brings into reality many new identities. What this film depicts is the flowing of relationships inherent to life, a genealogy of self. In a three-part relationship, lives the placenta, 
baby and mother in symbiosis. Next slide, please. Far from an abstract concept, scientists have discovered that women carry at least three unique cell populations in their body, their own, their mothers, and their child's, creating what biologists call a microchimera, micro suggesting that humans are not oppositional but constituent beings made of many. Finally, I'm in, greatly indebted to Rene Grip, who wrote of his 1935 painting, The Portrait that his objects will object to their objectification. <laughs> the eyeball is a language of personhood only because no other symbol is so expressive of an inner life and consciousness. The eyeball's gaze is, as Levinas says, an appeal. The face of a man is the medium through which the invisible in him becomes visible and enters into commerce with us. We do not conceive of relations, we are in relation. What this, what this makes clear to me is that Western conceptions of the non-human need a language just as powerful as this relational quality. In belly button, the eyeball is a means to an end, a means to express the inherent dignity and value of the placenta. However, I'm interested in how to move beyond this language in my work to express a relational quality that does not centralize the human experience. It's clear to me in the face of ongoing ecological crisis that our relationship to nature and non-human organisms must radically change, and so too our aesthetic language. <laughs> Above all, I have wonder for the mysteries of life as much for the intricacies of the human eyeball, evolution and the boundaries of the self. Being alive and making art are bound up together, and this force has the ability to enrich life exponentially. For me, art is a continual inquiry into the practice of living, a continual practice, which is, much, which is as much celebratory and passionate as it is lovely. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start off by like kind of introducing you to my work if you um, haven't seen it before. Um, this is just like a couple of paintings that I did in, I think 2020. Um, and yeah, I just feel like, um, you know, as a, as a kind of pre preset to this show, I was thinking about these like sort of symbols or motifs, like candles and butterflies and like melting bodies all together. And there was something kind of like bittersweet about it and um, kind of dreamlike and theatrical, but very like tender. And so I guess that's kind of what drew me to like being interested in um, being a part of this show. Um, and I think on the next slide, there's like, yeah, some more painting. So it's like, we're getting more into like, you know, warm glow, like the way that color works, like the way that the light hits the hand and like the cropping, I don't know, bring, Bring it into more portraiture. Um, I really love um, Edouard Munch's works. Um, I don't know, I just find them to be so like beautiful. They're a huge inspiration to my work. Like if you've seen my paintings, um, there's just like a roundness and a softness to them. And I think that they really stand out as um, as artworks, um, <laughs> obviously, um, but yeah, they're just very like fluid and kind of like, I don't know, they feel like watery almost, like you see like it's just like always like a vertical kind of like 
line coming down and like this one, these two figures kind of coming into each other. Like I love that idea of merging. And um, yeah, it's quite intriguing. Um, so like, so that's always been an inspiration, but um, recently, like as I was making works for this show, I became really inspired by kind of like, I'm, I'm always collecting imagery and like find it everywhere. Like I'll take a photo or I'll just um, have an idea in my head or I'll be on the internet, like, you know, Tumblr, like wherever. Um, and I came to found, I came to find that um, I really love the um, these Tumblr blogs that they were dedicated to the um, this like seventies eighties kind of retro um, like soft core pornography, um, but like the before shots like kind of before it leads up to you know whatever happens next, and I don't know I found that to be really interesting like there's this like desire and want in it like that I find really interesting but it's very like raw and a bit campy um yeah I don't know just like the way that there's always like some form of like they're drinking wine or something or like have a cigarette it's like very like yeah I don't know it's a bit funny but <laughs> um yeah I just found it to be quite like inspiring to look at. Um, and then I think in the next slide, yeah, so we see a bit more like references. So like obviously going for like a 70s vibe, I guess. Like, I mean, the Virgin Suicides um, film still is like kind of set in the 70s. Like, cause I don't know, I'm just born in the nineties and I feel like, I don't know what the seventies was like, but this is like my like really like you know <laughs> like fragmented like interpretation of what I think it is like it's very idealistic and like you know but um it's just like you know it's all the bands of like yeah like you know all the dreamers all the romantics like you just want to you know like look to something and feel like connected to it. Um, and then, yeah, basically I, I just see these images and become inspired by them. And um, I'll take various aspects from them. Um, and so like when I see like that image of the car before, I just thought like, you know, it was very captivating. Um, I guess the works are becoming more like narrative-like almost, like a little bit sometimes, but also a bit more like cropped. Um, but yeah, lots of like references to nature, like the flowers here and like the light kind of like it looks like like it was meant to be there outside of a pharmacy because I was really into perfumes and like kind of cheap perfumes so it's like chemist warehouse like vibes that didn't really come through in the end but I don't know I think it looks okay <laughs> um and then in the next slide um these are just like some preliminary sketches that I've done for my works um and again kind of like that idea of like the body kind of becoming one I find really interesting um yeah, and then it kind of becomes a painting. Um, and I don't know, something about like getting that warm light I felt was really like important for this show in particular. I was using a lot of like ultramarine blue before and it was like a completely different palette. So to kind of approach more of this kind of like, kind of resiny, kind of like browny, warm reds, all that yellow, all that stuff. Yeah, really. Um, I felt like it was connected to love in some way or romance. And then, um, yeah, this like is another image. It just sort of shows like my process um, because I'm always collaging um, and drawing. And I like to use just an app on my iPhone. It's called Brushes, where I just um, 
where we you can like draw over it like if it, i don't know i feel like as a painter you don't want to like waste canvas um <laughs> and like botch it um by doing something really bad so like you can use layers and stuff and it's really handy so I don't know that's just me but <laughs> yeah I it's that was a lot of fun and it helped me kind of like conceive the paintings differently I guess like it's another layer of like how they come out um yeah again like these are just kind of like excerpts from my sketchbook where I just um have a um they like kind of come from my mind or just like images that I've seen and I'll like draw them and then um, they end up just, I don't know, becoming the paintings. Like, um, yeah, just once again, like kind of like following that kind of like, like setting the scene, you know, like there's like this anticipation or like this hidden desire happening, like this unspoken thing. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of, it's quite cinematic too, actually. Like, I just feel like, um, yeah, I'm inspired by like photography and cinema, it's like the film still. Like a lot of this is about like the the moment of action happening and um or like the frozen moment, like that moment where it's like, you know, it, it's all very romantic and like everything is sort of like freezing in time and it's just like this expressionistic take on filmography or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then um, yeah, I just, you know. There's a bit of the surrealism <laughs> happening again and um, sort of like a disembodied like eroticism or romance. But um, yeah, basically like I was just excited to be in the show <laughs> and um, yeah, like um, kind of do something different. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to share this kind of work and, I love making it and um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Nibila. Um, and yeah, I thought I'd actually start here with food because I felt like uh, maybe that will help tell a bit of the story. Um, so I started exploring food at the beginning of 2020 and um, it mostly came out of this desire to explore what sculpture can be and what sculpture can do. So I was looking at a lot of um, dough and icing and things with really thick and gooey textures and also dry kind of materials. And I like that food as a materiality um, speaks a lot to construction as well. And so I wanted to start to build these um, supports for food to sit on and then also um, create a sort of environment for people to eat around. So I'm really interested mostly in sculpture and what sculpture can do and how I can bring sculpture so close to my life that it is entirely inseparable from me. Um, and things that I eat or things that I wear or um, just how I live. So I've been making um, recipes that kind of, um, yeah, feels like a bit of a sculptural process because I have a very, um, very strict studio practice that sometimes also feels like a, a recipe or a, a guided kind of instruction in itself. Next slide, please. So then after I started exploring food, it actually led me to all these um, other places where I started to um, create costumes and um, 
build larger sort of works using materials from the home. So the image at the top there is a big couch cake. I was also making a lot of cakes at the time. And um, yeah, I wanted to try stacking and seeing what would happen if I stacked a whole lot of cushions on top of each other and how I could create a certain type of lean. Um, and I was also very excited about actually pouring bucket loads of plaster on top of the, the cushions. Um, and this was sort of, I really wanted to immerse art into my life this year. So this was 2020. Um, and I, I just, I wanted to create almost like a, a project that involved art in everything. Um, so so if, uh, that's my um, birthday party as well. Um, the image at the bottom there. So I had, that was last year actually. So it's kind of continued on from beginning of 2020. Um, next slide please. And then this is an exhibition at home. So it's called Sculpture House. And it, um, it was during that time when we could, had, that little bit of time where people could come to your house. And I put together this home exhibition in, um, in the front room and invited people to come, come over and hang out and see the kind of works that I was making. And it was a really interesting way to actually exhibit because it felt like a very, um, so it's at home, it's a very personal space. And um, yeah, I was just interested in how bringing people into the home can create um, new friendships and connections as well. And then this is an exhibition that, um, that, was, that started last year and actually um, stayed up for, for more than six months because of the lockdown. But it's called Bird Brush and Other Essentials. And um, Again, it's exploring this idea of the home and domesticity um, and strange objects and kind of merging and twisting things around me into this kind of um, environment and figuring out a way to merge it all together through painting rags. Um, so yeah, it was like there's toothbrushes and washing machines and cream machines and cakes and birds. I was really um, obsessed with birds at the point at that time. Um, and sort of explosion, kitchen explosions. Next slide, please. I just wanted to put put it all up in a slide because it's sometimes my work's very hard to see because the installations they're they're very chaotic. Um, so I always like to photograph my sculptures in front of a white background. Um, but these works were from the Heidi Show. Yeah. Next slide. And then I also have been starting to do workshops and um, yeah, spend a bit more time in education. And so the installation at the bottom there is at Mama. Um, and we planned for this to be a making space. So it was like a residency and I would stay there um, and would make work and students and people would come in and would do all sorts of sculpture making workshops. But unfortunately we weren't able to have anybody in the actual space. So um, that didn't happen, but we made an online video. And, and then I also, with all of this food and um, sculptural stuff, I made recipe books and um, they ran a workshop at Mama in Albury, where kids uh, also made their own uh, slippery kind of sponges. And then I just wanted to share as well um, some of the smaller works that I've been making. And it's kind of moved away from, I think, a lot of the gooeyness that I was doing before, but it's a bit more refined, I feel like I'm moving more into this direction of. Um, formal like with color and pattern and texture and um, 
concealing everything that's inside. I always do that. So I make all of these armatures using wood and plastics and metals. And I like to conceal it with, um, with material. And so, um, yeah, with these works, it's, it feels really refreshing for me and um, also kind of exhausting at the same time. And I was talking to um, Lisa about it the other day about how, to me, um, this idea of love is very much process driven and um, the stages that I go through when I'm making. So there's different speeds. Um, I feel like when I start out, I'm very excited. Things are building. I get. I need to construct very, very quickly, and I have no time to even look at things because that will pull me back. And then when I start to apply things, time so, sort of slows down, and I get very obsessed with, and sometimes not in a, a very healthy way, but get very obsessed with what the potential of it is going to be. And then I get into this process of um, adding the colour and texture to it. And that's the part where it's sometimes just the most um, difficult because it, there's, I feel like there's a lot of pressure, you know, the final skin of the sculpture to do a lot and to perform a lot. And so, yeah, it's this kind of hyper intensity of making is what I feel like I've dedicated my life to. <laughs> Um, and then I just want to show a bit of, I'm now trying to add other materials into what feels like a, a, a body. And by that, I mean, I feel like I have a very fixed body with my sculptures that I, I know how to get to that body part. And now I'm extending out and things are sprouting and growing out from it. So on the right hand side, I've started to incorporate bronze into the body and then these sculptures that you will see um, at the opening tonight, I've included um, fabrics and lace and feathers and um, denim and yeah, all sorts of other materials. Uh, I wanted these works um, at the for this show to to feel fun and very like extra and dramatic and quite theatrical. And I wanna see if these sculptures can perform, that they can, they can do their thing. And so I just wanted to kind of dress them up a bit and thought a lot about clothing and um, layering clothes and um, yeah, points of focus. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Please stay. Um, hang on, let me just turn some house lights on. Are they coming? Oh, they are. Miracle, it's working. Um, uh, Rachel and Nick, why don't you come up as well? And then we can acknowledge you. I'll embarrass you while you're all standing on the stage. So please join me in thanking our speakers. And, and really, you know, it's a big ask. I was, as I was listening, I was thinking, oh my God, this is really a big ask because you've made all of the work, especially for the show. Yes. The openings tonight, there hasn't really been a lot of time to reflect on it as it's kind of living and breathing in a gallery space. And we asked you to share about it. So I so appreciate you, um, you know, being so vulnerable and, and letting us into your world. So when it's so fresh and raw, thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions, and the way we're going to do questions in Zoom land, yes, Jen? Jen's going to walk around with a microphone. Otherwise, oh yeah, actually, if you've got a question, we're going to embarrass you and you can come up the front, or if you don't want to come up the front, the other alternative is that you speak really, really loudly so that I can repeat it for everybody in Zoom land. Okay, anybody with a question? Yeah, please. Do 
Right. So the question is to Nabila, and it's asked, the question asks, you know, when you're making the work, how far ahead do you, uh, do you plan ahead? Have I got the question right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, especially for institutions. Nabila, do you want to come to the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Very good question. Um, I don't plan that much. I, I I don't like to do that because I can't I can't plan. I, I don't know how to plan. <laughs> so I I mean I have a feeling of how I want it to be. So if I like with Heidi, I knew I needed to make it really busy. So I knew I needed to bring a lot of things. Um, and yeah, it's, I, I feel, I look at the space and I, I respond to the space, but I just never know how that's ever gonna, ever gonna, um, look. And it's very hard. Installing is very hard. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's such a, because it can be so many different things and, but I, I do it through feeling and through the, how I want it how I want, when I walk, I, I walk in and out, in and out, in and out, so many times when I'm installing to try to feel what it's like to first walk in. But yeah, not too much planning. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we've got a question for Nick that's come in through Zoom. So why don't you come on over, Nick? And the question is, you know, how important is the notion of self-portraiture in your work, if indeed these paintings are self-portraits? Hi, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I that's really interesting actually, because I used to do self-portraits like a few years ago, but I haven't done it in a while. Um, and but I guess I don't know, I guess even the ones which aren't like technically portraits are like a self-portrait in a way, but that's like a bit, you know, we're getting a bit off track there. But um I mean it is important. I do I do see these like getting back into portraiture. I do put something of myself into it, Ooh. sort of like the they're not really of real people. Like I'll kind of like construct their fa facial features um, from like various drawings or photos or something. So it just like becomes something. But um, yeah, I, I want to do a self portrait this year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else with a question? Okay, I've got a question. And it's it comes off the back of Nick's question, but it's it's to you, Rachel. And it seems to me, and you can just say, David, you're so on the wrong track. If it, you know, but it seems to me that um, and, and it's with all of your works actually, I would it they just seem very big on theme mm -hmm. and less about a story. And, you know, there's, there's, the, the richness for me is in the thematic kind of exploration. And I just wondered if you could respond to that idea, if at all there is a response like, you can say, David, no, I'm so not into theme or whatever it is. But I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, if maybe it doesn't seem like it, but, um, like, I do a storyboard, like, everything, there's, like, a narrative to it. But maybe it's... Um, it gets subsumed by the process of making things. Mm. Um, so the narrative kind of drops away or um, I don't know if it was, uh, I can't remember the playwright, but uh, they said that they really enjoyed like the process of stripping away the bare bones of the, of the symbol um, uh, and the meaning kind of gets obscured. Mm. Um, so I kind of think of my um, narrative like that um where because everything's so lo-fi it's not always possible to um express the narrative as much as you would want so you kind of just have to let it go even though you know it's, it's in your head but um yeah it gets kind of left behind with the other technical things yeah great um we're going to finish art forum um this is our first art forum for 2022 we're right on time one o'clock um, but please, just a big, big thank you to Nabila, Nick, and to Rachel.
Thank you to everyone in Zoom land and thank you to all of the staff and students here in Federation Hall. And we look forward to you joining us at the opening. It's our first opening in two years of the gallery. I can hardly believe it, um, but 5.30 tonight to please, um, please join us to celebrate being my once in a lifetime with these three extraordinary artists. Thank you for being here.